Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Stephen Kelly. Stephen is the Associate Director of Research at the Yale Program on Financial Stability. Stephen joins us today to discuss the financial stability implications of the discount window. Stephen, welcome back to the program. Great to be back, David. It's great to have you on. And I am doing this show because I saw you moderate a panel that the Atlanta Fed had put together for its uh, annual financial conference. And it was a really fascinating conversation. But before we get into that, Stephen, would you share with us a bit about your center there, what you're doing on financial stability? Yeah. So we're sort of based on the, you know, fun presupposition that financial crises are not going to be prevented in every state of the world. And if you think about it, I mean, you don't want to design a system where the the probability of a financial crisis is zero, right? I and mean, that, that's not the optimal social percentage. And so really what we have here is freedom to think about crisis fighting exclusively. I mean, it, it, the sort of rule of crisis fighting policy amongst several, you know, international organizations is like, don't talk about fight club. And some of that is very real because the second Jay Powell comes out and says, well, we're thinking a lot about how to, how to fight financial crises, people get nervous, right? So it, it's a little bit of like, there are thousands of excellent economists working on what to do to prevent the next financial crisis. And then if you sort of say, okay, how many of you are working on what do we do and how do we design things when that prevention fails, the hands sort of go down. So we're, we're really f- focused almost exclusively on building a playbook for modern financial crises and sort of how you get a financial system restarted again. So what is your role in the Yale program on financial stability? What are you doing? So we are... Well, it dep- I mean, it depends because when I started, it was to work on 2008. And then yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're sort of supposed to be like cicadas, us, us financial stability folk. And <laughs> we're coming nice. up too frequently, basically, with 2020. And now 2020 is like a historical okay. example because of 2023. So you know, as things come up, we're very much working on current events. And obviously, we're going to talk today about a lot of the reforms that are coming up post-SVB, post-2023 banking crisis. But we do a lot of things here. We have a platform online called the New Badget Project, and this, again, speaks to our goal of sort of updating the playbook for fighting financial crises. The one thing you'll hear every central banker cite is Badget's dictum from Walter Badget. You know, about 150 years ago, he said, lend freely at a penalty rate against good collateral. And so we sort of know that's not enough to stop a financial crisis. And so we're sort of building that out. And we have a, a archive of historical interventions and sort of how, whether it was capital injections, liquidity, restructuring, you know, changes in the rules. We, we have hundreds of historical cases out on our platform that you can sort of click through and, and see what design components worked and what, what design components backfired. The idea being there are huge costs to getting these things wrong or to delays in implementing these things. And so we're trying to really gather all the ideas that have been out there over historical crises for historical interventions and Let's let's come up with a playbook that works and let's make it so that policymakers don't even have to think about it. They can just go to our new badge platform, go to the other things that we're writing and sort of say, OK, here's the design features we need to think about based on this problem that we're having in our financial system. So we have the new badge platform, which I encourage everyone to go check out. We have interviews with historical crisis fighters, sort of what they were thinking at the time. We have tons of, uh, of interviews that we've conducted with folks who've fought crises in the past. We have a journal of financial crises that comes out quarterly where we publish case studies and other articles on financial stability. We have conferences. We got we're we're staying busy over here and, and like I said, a little a little busier than we were expected to be with current events over over recent years, but nevertheless. So one of the things you did recently in your work is you moderated a panel, as I mentioned previously. It was a part of the twenty eighth annual Atlanta Fed Financial Markets Conference. And this year it was titled Central Banking in a Post-Pandemic 
financial system. So you were there. Now, was this in Florida? My understanding is off the coast of Florida. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So sunny Florida in May. What a perfect place to be talking about financial stability issues. And your specific panel was titled Domestic Liquidity Provision During Potential Crisis. And it focused largely on the discount window and issues related to that. So you let out, you had your own remarks. In fact, we'll provide a link to your remarks. They were informative too. Great person to lead out in this conversation, but you had several guests. You had Bill Nelson, as uh, listeners will know, past uh, guests on the podcast, your colleague, Susan McLaughlin, and then Luke Levine, if I'm saying his name correctly, he's the director general of the Directorate of General Research at the ECB. So we had two people from the Yale Program of Financial Stability there, and then Bill Nelson, from BPI, and then an ECB official as well. And to kick this off, Stephen, let me read some of your remarks. I want to use your remarks as a way to kind of get this conversation going, what you guys chatted about. I want to read the first two paragraphs. I think it captures the kind of the spirit well of what went down. You say, it's rare that after a financial crisis, political consensus begins to form around the government more ably supporting banks. But that's precisely the moment we are in, where political furor would normally spell the end of some FISIS crediting tools. It has instead focused on how to make them more effective, at least in the case of central bank lending in the Fed's discount window. And you go on to note that there's broad support for this. It seems to be having a momentum of its own. It's moving forward. And as it turned out at that conference, Vice Chair for Banking Regulation, Michael Barr, had some announcements. So I want to talk about this issue here. First, let's talk about kind of the momentum behind it. You've touched on already the SVB crisis, 2023, the banking turmoil then. Also, we can talk about Michael Barr's speech and then maybe some of the issues going forward, as well as is there congressional support for it. So I had Bill Nelson on previously, and we chatted about some of this interest. This was G30 report, I believe, the acting control of the currency had a speech on it. Bank supervisors were talking about it. But was Michael Barr's speech kind of an official launch? Or what was accomplished in his speech at this conference that led into your panel discussion? Yeah, th- this was the first real clarity we got from the Fed on what they're thinking about liquidity-wise post-SVB. Obviously, all the stuff with Basel III Endgame sort of predated SVB, and then it's all gotten mixed up, and that has been front and center. We haven't had much clarity from exactly what the Fed is thinking on liquidity until this speech. Granted, it was all leaked in the New York Times uh, several months ahead of this. There was some more reporting in the Wall Street Journal. But what we got is a few things of how the Fed's thinking about this. I mean, one is that broadly, he said, like, we're looking at the scope of our liquidity regulations in general. And so I th- I think the way to read this is probably like, okay, SVB shouldn't have fallen outside of the LCR world. So, you know, there, there's sort of been a general rethinking about what constitutes a big bank post-2023. So that thinking is going on. But then he offered some more specifics, one of which was to limit banks' inclusion of held-to-maturity assets towards their liquidity regulation. So limiting the inclusion of held-to-maturity assets towards what's called HQLA or high-quality liquid assets. And this sort of makes sense on its face, right? Like to the extent you're telling the accountants, oh, we're going to hold this to maturity. You can't be telling the banking regulators, oh, we're going to sell this if we need liquidity. That's just a a harmonizing really of uh, of accounting with the regulation. And it it makes sense with the experience that we saw last year. Like banks are very hesitant to sell held to maturity assets that have unrealized losses on them because the second you sell them, you have to recognize the losses and potentially the losses in that whole accounting categorization. Perhaps more relevant for our discussion today was two other things he mentioned. One was to ratchet up the deposit outflow assumptions in liquidity regulations for certain customers. He specifically mentioned high net worth individuals and crypto and VC firms. We can talk more about this in a minute, but just the the last thing he said, they're looking at particularly for, again, this, this is all for banks, he said, of a certain size. So it's a kind of a guessing game at that point, but you can think of maybe 10 billion, maybe 50 billion, maybe 100 billion. So he said that the Fed is looking at requiring a level of discount window preparedness. So this is just the ability to borrow from the discount window, which banks are sort of woefully unprepared to do. And as part of that, the Fed is looking at requiring a total sum of both pre-position collateral and reserves that equals some percentage of a bank's uninsured deposits. The Wall Street Journal has reported that the Fed is sort of circling 40%. So figure reserves plus the haircut adjusted value of prepositioned collateral must equal f- at least 40% of your uninsured deposits. 
So you can think of like a bank like SVB, which was you know, approaching $200 billion in uninsured deposits, would need some level of collateral at the window plus reserves that would effectively equal 40% of those uninsured deposits instead of the $5.3 billion that it was able to borrow before it failed. So this provides clarity in where the Fed is going with this. Do we have any timetables for when it will actually go into action? We don't. We don't. And a- as you mentioned, there is sort of activity on the Hill as well. And so you yeah. know, these, these discussions are all happening at once, both in the House. We, you, there's been a bill from Representative Barr, no relation as far as, <laughs> as far as I know to Michael Barr, that basically just asks the Fed to study the discount window and come up with a remediation plan for all its shortcomings. Okay. Senator Mark Warner has announced that he's releasing a bipartisan bill. It, it's sort of gotten punted a little bit, and it may be out by the time this podcast airs. But that's looking at mandatory testing of the discount window, giving banks credit for their discount window preparedness in their liquidity ratios. And we can talk more about that. Expanding the discount window hours. You know, we sort of saw that West Coast banks were disadvantaged basically by the Fedwire hours, as well as general things like reducing stigma and increasing coordination between the Fed regional banks and the FHLBs. Okay, so there is much happening. There's uh, work going on in Congress. The Fed has proposed what it's going to do. And as we mentioned, a lot of momentum already behind this coming out of last year. So one thing that Vice Chair Michael Barr mentioned, in addition to the discount window material, I want to come back to that, but he also mentioned as part of a package that it would be good for banks also to think about this resolution resources, I believe is the term he used. So like living wills, which we're familiar with, but he also pushed long-term debt. And I just want to ask you about that briefly. And again, we'll go back to discount window issues in a minute. But is he talking about like contingent convertibilities, cocoa bonds? Is that what he's thinking about here? So in the US, it's this is not the Credit Suisse thing. This is really okay. about when a bank fails a layer that you can then bail in in resolution. The biggest thing you get from this, I think, is protection of the deposit insurance fund. You have this extra layer okay. of debt that when a bank fails, you know, you, you can sort of bail in these debt holders. So that that's what he's thinking about there. Okay. So not Coco is totally different, but uh, that was an interesting development. You're right with, with the banks in Europe recently. Okay. Back to the discount window issues. So we have this momentum going and a lot of excitement maybe behind it. I, I know Bill Nelson and I have chatted about this some more, and I'll come back to some of the questions that he has raised about it. But in your remarks, going back to that, you mentioned this excitement, but then you also throw in some caution, like would it have made much difference in 2023 with specific banks versus, say, a systemic crisis? So maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, so it's it sort of put me in an awkward position as someone who's been you know, thinking about ways to reform the discount window and and really not believing that it can accomplish a ton of what some folks want it to. And I share the examples in, in the in the remarks, which I encourage folks to check out, not just because my remarks are so great, but it's also heavily cited. It's, there's a lot of good reading stuff for folks interested in the issue. I mentioned in the remarks that Randy Quarles is on record saying, hey, if the discount window worked, if the discount window was functional and worked the way it was supposed to, SVB would still be here. And Michael Barr, his his successor in the in the VC for supervision role, has said, okay, discount window access or lack thereof or its functionality is not the reason that these banks failed, which I, I think is much more convincing, not least because even from an accounting perspective, SVP was underwater. But you know, I kind of wanted to raise the issue of like, okay, you know, we're we're sort of agreeing on some of these technical changes. Around prepositioning or hours or 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 you know mandatory testing, but we sort of have. I'm saying we as the royal we folks thinking about this sort of have a still a wide spectrum of views on what the discount window can accomplish, and I think it's important that we sort of give up the idea that the discount window alone can really rescue a bank that is facing a run in the market due to perceived non-viability. I mean, if you think about what it means for a bank to go to the discount window that's facing a run, it's replacing its depositors with the Federal Reserve. So not only are its interest costs going up substantially, you know, from effectively zero to, you know, in, in present case, over 5%, but your depositors are your future lending franchise, they're who your employees have customer relationships with. So, you know, the idea that we can 
keep a bank in business that has been deemed non-viable just by reassuring customers of full repayment, I think is lacking. That's a necessary but not sufficient condition. And you know, I, I share the examples of Credit Suisse where they put $200 billion, over $200 billion in the window for Credit Suisse, which was more than any estimate of how much liquidity could have run, how much it would have needed. And you saw the run continue. And then I, I've talked about this on this podcast before, but the SVB Bridge Bank, which sort of took on the deposits immediately, or not immediately, but the Monday after SVB was was closed, was advertising that it had unlimited FDIC protection for even new deposits. So the, the SVB Bridge Bank was advertising basically like Fed accounts. <laughs> I mean, th- this was the safest bank in America, and it continued to bleed deposits because there are other reasons to run from a bank and you're thinking about your future relationship with the bank, its ability to be there for you in the future. So anyway, the point being is like once a, once a bank has been deemed non-viable, it's it's very hard to recover from that. And the discount window certainly isn't enough. I like to I like to share the analogy of of being broken up with or attempted to be broken up with. Like imagine you know Friday, ideally after after the bank closes, you get broken up with. And then, you know, Sunday night before Asia opens, she says, all right, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll give it another shot. Come Monday morning, you're still going to be like, whoa, I almost got broken up, you know, and you're going to have a wandering eye more than you would have before. Right. And that's sort of an analogy for the depositors, for the employees. Like nobody wants to be a, an employee at a bank that almost failed or at a bank that is funding itself via the government. So anyways, I, I, I wanted to put that out there as, as one thing that we cannot forget is that the discount window is great from a systemic perspective. It's not going to save that one bank. It might get that bank to the weekend, which would be fantastic. I mean, if you think about what was most damaging about SVB's failure when it did fail fr- that Friday morning was that originally the government said, hey, you know, we're not going to bail in. We're not going to rescue uninsured depositors. They'll get some of their money next week, and then we'll find out you know, what they get in resolution. But by Sunday, they do the systemic risk exception, right? And so if you have that time, if you can get SVB to the weekend, and maybe you get, you get your ducks in a row to do other you know, more substantive policy responses like the systemic risk exception, you contain some of the damage. So it, it, it's great in a world where you're, you're thinking about systemic demand for reserves going up or when you're talking about getting a bank to the weekend, but you're not going to save a bank. Okay, so that was one thing. And then the other thing is fire sales aside, you know, you think about this kind of windows like, okay, we're trying to get banks to not fire sale their assets and, and, and face fire sale values on whether it's, you know, loans or whatever else. But there's a there's a, a step that happens before that, which is when you take an asset off a bank balance sheet, you've lost sort of the the franchise value that comes with held to maturity funding at the deposit curve, which is lower than even the treasury curve. So irrespective of fire sales, once you take an asset off a bank balance sheet, you, you know the, there's immediate franchise value loss and asset value loss, and we can talk about the BTFP and sort of the implications of that. But so I, I sort of raised the the elephant in the room, which is like, if you're in a world where every asset has fallen substantially in value because of interest rates, I mean, this is not, you know, 2023 wasn't really about credit risk. We're thinking about interest rates. That's much harder for the central bank to ignore. Like in 2008, literally FASB is coming out and saying, hey, you know, if stuff's really illiquid, you don't have to market exactly to uh, what markets are saying. They're never going to do that with interest rates. Interest rates are, are clear as day, and they're endogenous to monetary policy, not to the central bank's financial stability policy, which can contain certain credit risks and sort of make its valuations true in the end. So those were sort of the challenges that I raised. And just the BTFP, I think, shows that we need to think about valuing collateral the same way we think about setting the rates or collateral eligibility for a crisis time facility which is we think about what what would be the case in normal times right you don't you don't set a penalty rate relative to the crisis time rates when when market rates go way up you as the central bank don't add the penalty rate to that you say okay what was the interest rate the day before the crisis and we'll add 50 basis points to that and that's our rate you do the same thing with collateral eligibility like everyone's worried about housing bonds but you say okay but Yesterday they were AAA and calm, so we're gonna 
let housing bonds be eligible collateral. But we sort of haven't done that with valuation. And there's a valuation advantage to being able to keep assets on bank balance sheets. These are all important issues. And one thing you noted in your piece that really struck me, and I've heard you say this elsewhere, is the Fed could recapitalize the entire banking system simply by lowering rates, right? Get lower rates, suddenly those bond prices go up. So a lot of the, these issues you mentioned are endogenous to policy. There's also credit risk, which is, is different. It's endogenous to uh, the Fed facilities that you've outlined to summarize, there are issues with the individual banks in terms of this this increased use of the discount window, but overall, we're moving in the right direction for a systemic crisis. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So let me give a little pushback on the whole notion of these liquidity regulations. So as you know, I recently had Anat Amadi on the show, and she's all in on the capital regulations, making sure banks fund with more capital. But she really has no time or place for liquidity regulations. And let me just read a quote from that show. This was March 18, 2024. I'm going to get your response to it. And I, I had just said, hey, I see you're shaking your head. I was doing the video with her. And she said this, I'm shaking my head because I'm not a fan of liquidity requirements. Number one at all. We created central banks to solve pure liquidity problems. If a bank is insolvent, it doesn't have a run because it has a central bank. I view liquidity requirements, the liquidity coverage ratio, and all that as costly on good days and useless in the run. The cost benefit just is not there. And then she goes on to praise capital requirements. So so what would you say to someone like that who is skeptical of, of these type of exercises, the discount window discussion we're having today is about the liquidity requirements and giving banks you know, better access to liquidity in crisis. So how would you respond to that? Well, I think she's absolutely right about you know these regulations being useless in a run. If you look at banks, high quality liquid assets as a percentage of, of total assets, they have effectively quintupled since 2008. And what do we have to show for it but the fastest bank run in history? Fair enough. So, you know, it goes back to my point about SVB. Like, it's never going to be good enough for SVB. It, it, it's helpful system wide to some degree. Like, if you're Schwab, you know, you benefit, you benefit yeah. from having liquid assets. Then there's the question of like, is that really what we want banks to be, to be doing all this self insuring? And, you know, Anat offers an interesting corner solution, which is much higher capital. I have reservations about how much capital there is in the world. I, I think it's sort of our, our, our scarcest resource. And you have to think about, what exactly that means for the structure and size of the financial system. Perhaps the opposite corner solution is the Mervyn King solution, which he calls the pawnbroker for all seasons, which is you get rid of all capital requirements, all deposit insurance, and you just require that all short-term liabilities from banks be backed by sufficient collateral at the discount window. And in that world, your capital requirements are basically the haircut that you face the discount window. You're able to pay out all depositors, and you know the, you can wind down much more slowly. So those corner solutions exist. I think there's drawbacks to both of them. We seem to be moving in the direction more of the of the King solution. And, and part of the value and sort of the relative free lunch and prepositioning for liquidity regs is there's a lot of collateral out there that really has no higher purpose, right? I mean, banks are sitting on loan collateral. It's not as if they're repoing that on a daily basis and, and, and pre-positioning collateral is going to reinvent you know, the financial system. But I think it, it would be the least disruptive, at least directionally, to get substantially more discount window pre-positioning. I like how you approach this, Steve, and you're very much an economist. There's trade-offs, right? There's there's cost, opportunity cost. And if you go to one corner solution, you're potentially giving up some gains on the margin going the other direction, right? So maybe we've, we've gone one direction really strongly. It's time to look back and maybe there's some big marginal gains going to the other corner solution where we do park collateral at the discount window, make more use of it. And that is, in fact, what the world is doing right now, at least in the U.S. I guess the question, is there a similar development or they have already taken place in other major central banks like the ECB or Bank of England? Any knowledge there about what's happening? Not that I know of really substantially. Every every jurisdiction looks at prepositioning a little bit differently. I mean, yeah. I think the, the biggest reservation, which which is a fair reservation, is as central bankers, we don't want to imply commitment to giving some level of liquidity in a crisis. So yeah. if, if you give me some collateral today... I'm not going to promise you that 
when the crisis comes around, I'm going to give you X amount of dollars on it. And that makes sense. I think the problem is that, so right now we have something like $3 trillion of collateral sitting at the discount window. And banks are being told that that's worth $0 in their internal liquidity stress tests, in their LCR, in their net stable funding ratio, in their resolution plans. And so, you know, you can understand the central bank view of like, okay, we have $3 trillion of collateral from you guys, you know, haircut adjusted, it would be, uh, you know, let's say $2.5 trillion. And in a crisis, the value might fall, it might fall, it might fall to $2.5 trillion, in which case haircut adjusted is $2 trillion or whatever. But it's not clear that the most appropriate value to assign to that is zero. Right. So that's sort of the trade-off world that we need to figure out is how much can – there's a limit to how much the discount window can be encouraged by Jay Powell and Michael Barr going out and saying, hey, we love the discount window. There has to be some carrot involved. And it's not going to be just a handout to the banks. I mean, asking them to preposition is costly. Mm-hmm. It will take – tech costs and upfront charges and all these things. And maybe you increase, maybe you tighten up. I mean, like I said, Michael Barr's looking at tightening deposit outflow assumptions for certain kinds of depositors. So maybe you tighten liquidity regs at the same time, but there's some sort of carrot where you're giving credit for prepositioning and not pretending that this discount window, which is not a crisis time tool, right? It's a through the crisis tool. Same with the standing repo facility not pretending that that's going to be worth zero. Yeah. So the push here is to make all that collateral that's currently sitting at the discount window count towards liquidity requirements, at least some part of it, yeah. you know, haircut. And maybe in the future, banks would park even more collateral there if they see it's a good investment right. of their resources. But to get there, there's certain hurdles we've got to get through. And one of them being the stigma. And I know Michael Barr in his speech, he talked about this. He mentioned they really have to get on top of the bank supervisors and examiners to to change their mindset. So it's not going to be something that happens overnight. It's going to take some work. And, and there's a number of of issues, and I want to bring them up beyond just the the general you know stigma issue. One of them that you have written about is in an article titled "Weekly Fed Report Still Drives Discount Window Stigma." So you talk about how the reporting requirements that the Fed currently does still creates challenges that makes banks uncomfortable to use the discount window. So tell us about that challenge. Yeah. So the the Fed, as listener, as many listeners will know, the Fed every week publishes a balance sheet called the H41, where it discloses balance sheet items as of that Wednesday and the week average. It discloses every Thursday night. And as part of that disclosure, it's broken out by the 12 regional Fed banks. And so the historical issue with this disclosure was, okay, if you're a reasonably sizable bank in in one of the given Fed districts, you know, based on where your headquarters is, is sort of where you borrow from the Fed. If there's rumors going around about, say, Wells Fargo, and all of a sudden there's a huge increase in borrowing at the San Francisco Fed, that's going to, you know, further stigmatize Wells Fargo. It's gonna it's gonna encourage rumors, it's gonna encourage a run. And the Fed was very aware of this. And what it did in 2020 at the start of COVID was it said, okay, now when we break down the regional balance sheets, we're going to combine discount window lending at the regional level into our securities allocation. So when we're doing QE, we have the, or we have a massive SOMA portfolio that's allocated across each regional bank, and we're going to stuff the discount window borrowing into those numbers, and that's going to help protect and sort of disguise those numbers. And that's true to some degree. The problem is that QE is public and basically you can back out. And so the, the note you mentioned that I wrote, it was, was, you know, I I sort of played hedge fund analyst for the day and wrote and wrote this thing is very real. I mean, Bill Demchek, the CEO of PNC at a Brookings event a few weeks back said, look, these disclosures are regional. And the second we borrow, it'll show up in that data. And so, you know, PNC is in the Cleveland Fed district. So if people are kind of thinking about PNC and all of a sudden $10 billion gets borrowed, you know, who else in the Cleveland Fed district might that be? And so that's sort of the concern. But so anyways, now you can you can still back out QE basically based on assumptions and disclosures about the allocations across districts. But also when the Fed is not doing QE, it's really easy to back it out. So mm. 
literally the week of SVB, the Wall Street Journal published this chart of borrowing by district because the Fed was done doing QE, right? So the, it just looked at the increase in regional Fed balance sheet totals. And there was a ton in San Francisco, of course. There was a, a ton in New York. And so folks were relatively calm with that because, okay, it's SVB and First Republic and all these names we already know out West and it's Signature Bank in New York. But there's sort of an alternative world, right, where PNC does want to tap the window and all of a sudden the Cleveland number goes way up. Or I mentioned Schwab before. I, I mean, folks may remember Schwab was kind of on the brink or, you know, at least in the headlines last spring. Imagine the Dallas district goes up $10 billion or whatever. It's okay. Schwab's at the window. Schwab's going down, you know, and the run is perpetuated. Right. So, so this risk is, is still out there. The Fed did a little to mask it, but it's really, a, you know, a few Excel cells away from packing the number out. <laughs> you can't casually look at the number, but any hedge fund can find it or back it out. Many reporter can can do the same. And so, I, I sort of argue they need a little more aggregation to to disguise those numbers. Yeah, it was really interesting to see your exercise where you did back out the actual amounts, whether it's from looking at the aggregates when, when you know QE is ended and you can still see the change, or if you go back historically to when they did report the differences and just simply add things up to the present. Yeah. So you, you want to aggregate more information. Would you also change the timing? Do you, do you still want it to come out weekly? I mean, or just aggregate it up? So the, the Federal Reserve Act requires the Fed to disclose its balance sheet weekly. Okay. So, you know, absent a change from Congress, but the fact that they've already done this aggregation, you know, I'm arguing for just a little bit more aggregation. And really, okay. I think if you think about the spirit of the Dodd-Frank Act, which now requires that the Fed release borrower identities on a two-year lag, technically it's eight, eight calendar quarters, that's already proven to be stigmatizing. And so- the fact that we're going from that to like, okay, if you're a, if you're a sizable regional bank, we can find you every week. You know that's incredibly stigmatizing, and really, even even folks who are for the disclosure in Dodd Frank, you must see that this undermines the spirit of that compromise of okay, we'll at least wait two years. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes, and this is one practical suggestion on this journey to better use the discount window to meet these liquidity requirements and hopefully make banks more secure as a whole of the system. And and we'll come back to this later, but Bill Nelson's goal of also shrinking the Fed's balance sheet, he, he would hope that this would reduce the structural demand for reserves if they can simply go to the, the discount window. All right, so that's one potential solution or, or fix towards getting us closer to this destination. So another one I want to bring up comes from Bill Nelson, and he had an article recently titled Something Old and Something New, Two Potential Beneficial Discount Window Facilities. And his basic idea is this. He wants to restart the term auction facility and also really work up these facilities called committed liquidity facilities. So the term auction facility, many will remember, was used after the great financial crisis. The Fed would auction off you know, funds from the discount window, and it had a whole lot less stigma associated with it because you weren't going to the discount window, you were going to the auction. The committed liquidity facilities would be collateral that is committed to the Fed, and in turn, the Fed commits lines of credit to the banks. So his point is together, like if we start doing the term auction facility, so banks get used to, they get comfortable going to the discount window, and then you combine it with the committed liquidity facility, you're really on a path of getting past the stigma barrier and to making you know the use of the discount window kind of normal operating procedures. Any thoughts on it? Yeah, I buy that totally. The, the TAF, the term auction facility in 2008, 2007, I guess, really was stigma reducing, partially because of this auction mechanism, which you know we, we've found here at the L Program of Financial Stability is is really helpful with stigma. The other thing is sort of a historical accident, which is that for technical reasons, the funds from the TAF auctions didn't settle until a, a day or two later, and so the the market was able to view this as like, oh, this is not a bank who is in desperate need of funds today. This is a bank that can wait two days for the funds and is just, you know, getting a good rate on some market based funds. So th there are some interesting things there. The committed liquidity facility idea, you know, is a sound one. The I think the challenge, and uh, you know, I've been trying not to mention the FHLBs until this point, but they they are a challenge in this in this space because. The Fed's discount window 
is legally constrained to four months max. I mean, you can roll that over, but it cannot make more than a four month loan. The FHLBs have term structures out 30 years. And so the FHLBs are really partners with banks when it comes to establishing liquidity lines and building out a liquidity framework. And it would be very difficult, again, absent some regulatory stick for the Fed to sort of usurp that role as long as the FHLBs exist as they do and the Fed's limits are what they are. Yeah, so Bill does bring that up, the FHLB issue, and he hopes that the the TAFs, the term auction facilities, would would maybe take away some of that. But you're saying the advantages offered by the FHLB in terms of you know longer term lines of credit may outweigh you know getting familiar with the discount window and all that. One question on the committed liquidity facilities, and maybe this is a question for, for Bill Nelson, but I'll throw it at you too. How is that any different than what's being proposed currently for the discount window? So my, you know, my understanding is, again, we want to use the collateral at the discount window to count towards liquidity requirements. Is that any different than what he's proposing with the CLF? So it's slightly different in that, you know, prepositioning doesn't give you, I mean, you think about the way you get a credit line from a bank. It's, yeah. oh, I have, you know, a $100 million credit line. Prepositioning doesn't give you a $100 million credit line with the Fed. You can put $120 million of collateral and expect to get $100 million, but it's not, you know, to use the word committed. And, okay. and that's part of the challenge of liquidity planning and, you know, the culture of the Fed and whatever else. Okay. Yeah. He mentions, I believe, Australia and South Africa. Their central banks have, have used these before. Uh, one other interesting thing from his article, just throw it out there. The uh, term auction facility was actually an idea that was originally proposed and it was called the auction credit facility in the early 2000s in response to the fact that we were actually running down the national debt. <laughs> there was a worry we ran out of treasury securities for the Fed to hold on the asset side of its balance sheet. So, oh no, what will the Fed do? And they figured, well, we can maybe do more discount you know, loans, but how are we going to do that with stigma? Well, let's do an auction credit facility was a term they called it and then it was you know, renamed term auction facility in the crisis. So interesting turn of events from a shortage of, of public debt to now an overabundance where we have a treasury market that struggles with handling all of it. Okay, so if Bill Nelson's ideas go forward, add those on top of your proposal for aggregation, we maybe make some progress. But let's circle back to the FHLB issue, because you have an article you wrote with some of your colleagues at the Yale Program on Financial Stability, and, and maybe some suggestions for dealing with that big thorny problem. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's a lot there's a lot wrong with them to some degree i mean first i should say like you can't just destroy them overnight as i kind of alluded they are liquidity partners of banks and they are an essential part of the system now for reallocating liquidity and you know part of banks contingency funding plans what i wrote with colleagues Susan McLaughlin and Andrew Metric we we sort of go through how the FHLBs actually reimburse you know, because the FHLB's members are their member banks, they pay dividends to their member banks, and it's not based on size or or housing activity or anything like that. It's based on how much you borrow. So, I mean, imagine the Fed paying out its profits to the banks that borrow the most from the discount window. It goes into the pricing advantage that FHLBs often have. And so our proposal is, look, if you want to keep those dividends to members, fine. You know, that's part of how the system works, but let's pay them out based on the FHFA's housing goals as opposed, you know, how much lending banks are actually doing into whether it's low income housing or housing, you know, sort of pick your allocation, but not based on, oh, I took a bunch of treasuries or, or MBS to the FHLBs and did some, some low cost borrowing and now I'm getting the dividend. So that, that was our proposal in that article, but there, there are various challenges. I mean, w what we hear from banks and, and the surveys reflect this is just the presence of the FHLBs sort of adds to the stigma of the window. The FHLBs have much less disclosure. We talked about disclosure before with the discount window. The FHLBs are much less there's much less disclosure. Really, in, in this article, we talk about how really inaccessible the, the even the lending terms are at most of the FHLBs, but there's sort of all these problems. We saw this with, with SVB too, which one of the issues of the FHLBs is 
if you want to borrow a substantial amount of money, the FHLPs have to go out and raise it. And so you may be getting money at T plus one as opposed to T plus zero, which in, in, in SVB's case made all the difference. You know, if, you, if you're getting to them late enough in the day, they can't print money the way the Fed could. So sort of their existence just kind of gets in the way. It, it, it can slow down the Fed's ability to get sufficient collateral. The FHLBs don't really have the prudential insight that, that regulators do. And so, you know, what we see is basically when a crisis gets bad enough, the FHLBs raise haircuts or they'll just cut off lending. And we don't see that behavior from the Fed. So there's sort of all these all these issues roped together. But the FHLPs are basically capturing seniorage that they that they get from being counted as government debt to issue into money market funds, and then they pay it out to those who borrow the most from them. Okay, so if you had to rank all the challenges we've gone over, so too much disclosure, just not being familiar with it, so that's kind of Bill Nelson's proposal, get us used to it, get it, get us going, or the FHLB, and then maybe some other ones as well. Where would you rank those? Would, would the FHLB be near, be near the top, or would it, these other ones be uh, pretty important too? The, I mean, they're all at the top. These things all work together. <laughs> okay, I think, okay. I think the biggest thing is you have, as of now, you basically have no regulatory or supervisory incentive to be prepared to use the discount window to have collateral there. So you, you can't have no carrot basically for, for using the discount window. You're never going to solve the stigma problem. You can't really solve it with pricing. I mean, part of the issue is pricing. And if you think about, like I talked about before, going to the discount window, you're replacing low cost deposits with market-based rates. And the Fed can't really go any lower on that rate. Right now, the discount window is priced at the top end of the Fed funds rate. It used to be 100 basis points premium. You can't really put it below Fed funds because then you have an arbitrage uh, or you can't put it below IOR or whatever. So you can't really do much more on pricing. And as long as the pricing exists the way it does, you have to have other incentives. You have to at least beat out the FHLBs. You have to have credit for regulatory purposes or or some other incentive because as long as there's no incentives, it's going to be stigmatized because – it's going to be seen as the lender of last resort. It's going to be seen as why are you even talking about it? Why are you practicing it? Why are you, you know, prepared right. to use it? Why is it part of your funding plans if you don't actually intend to use it? Just the lack of, of incentive is a problem and it creates all these other issues. It creates the stigma, it creates lack of competitiveness with the FHLBs and all these things. So just imagine a world where the FHLB went away. So Congress acted, I know it's unlikely, but just just pretend with me, they disappear quickly. Would there be a missing market for banks? As you just, we mentioned earlier that the Fed only can go four months out in the discount window. And so that the rest of that way like, of, of that term structure is being met by FHLB. So would there be a missing market? Would the Fed need to have some changes to its Federal Reserve Act as well to meet that market? Potentially. I mean, potentially you get the private market to do this. Remember, the FHLBs are just a collective of all their members, which is banks, credit unions, insurance companies. You, you know, you lose the seniority and the joint issuance of debt and all those things. But like I said, they're, they're liquidity partners to their members in a way that the Fed will probably never be, even if you change the rules. So you get some replacement with the private markets. But you run the risk, uh, like I said, you can't just destroy the FHLBs and then hope the Fed improves. You have to have other incentives in place. The, the FHLBs, the week of, the week after SVB, I think they borrowed half a trillion dollars in the market. I mean, is the Fed really willing to step into that breach and right. do that much lending? I mean, you're talking about a cultural change too. Again, it depends on the supervisor, it depends on the regional bank, but you're talking about a cultural change about how the discount window is viewed across the Fed system. Let me ask the question this way. Is the FHLB truly a market innovation or is it kind of created by subsidies implicit or explicit from government? I mean, is it there because there's truly a market need for it or has it arisen due to, you know, government structure and design? I mean, I would say it's both. It definitely benefits from, you know, call it seniorage, call it arbitrage. The the CBO put out a report that put its expected Implicit subsidy this year at over $7 billion. Last year, which was a super profitable year for the FHLB system, they made a little over $6 billion. So to some extent, yes, the, the, the profitability of the system only exists because of the subsidy. The main one being that it can issue debt into government money market funds. But 
there is some innovation and there is in theory a private sector alternative to what it does as of you know effectively a, a bank clearinghouse and you know the the joint and several liability that of all its members that it uses of the joint and several liability of the system and it's supported by its members that's advantageous and if you could recreate that i mean you're sort of back in the 1900 world of clearing houses but there was there was advantages to those but yeah you can't yeah. you just can't destroy it overnight yeah well, it sounds like Vice Chair Michael Barr has his work cut out for him, along with all the other people at the Board of Governors and other bank regulators who are wanting to go in this direction of more use of the discount window. Now, let's circle back to your panel, because that was the original motivation for this show. So again, it was at the Atlanta Federal Reserve Financial Market Conference. It was in May. And you had two other guests. I, I mentioned Bill Nelson, but uh, did Luke... Laven or Susan McLaughlin, do they have any other thoughts you want to share with the audience? Well, Susan had, you know, a really, she kind of has a novel idea. She really wants to separate more primary credit and secondary credit. So these are sort of the two levels of the discount window, primary credit being sort of the through the cycle. It's supposed to be no questions asked. You know, we, we sort of don't see that in, in practice everywhere in every case, but it's for solvent, you know, well-capitalized banks. And then Secondary credit is a little more punitive and it's designed to be kind of for banks that have low capital or that are otherwise going through solvency issues. And she really wants to separate these facilities and really just have a no questions asked facility for solvent banks that she, you know, she talks about automation and things like that, which again closes some of the gap with the FHLPs, but automation, not not all this, oh, I've got to call the discount window and then wait for approval. So kind of separating the these the so-called good guys and the good banks from what's effectively a resolution financing facility. She's she's got some articles out showing exactly how often people use secondary credit or come off secondary credit, which is not frequently. It's effectively a bridge to resolution or or other things. And she's looked at at other jurisdictions as well, and there's much more distinction between the two facilities. And so her hope is that sort of renaming, redesigning these facilities can reduce some of the stigma associated with running them both in parallel. So, so she's she's very focused on that. Luke Luke was much more critical of the uninsured deposits like situation that we ended up in, and really he saw this as a much higher order problem than anything to do with the discount window, and really thinks like we should have never let banks fund themselves with, you know, north of 90% uninsured deposits or 80 some percent uninsured deposits like we saw with SVB and Signature. Well, there are challenges to that because if you want to run a business like banking Silicon Valley, like by, by its nature, you're going to have uninsured deposits. Like there are some business models there where by their nature, you're going to have uninsured deposits. If you're BNY Mellon, for instance, yeah. or if you're trying to bank a certain sector, but he he was very much focused on that more than than the discount window and the BTFP. Okay. Well, we'll provide a link to that panel in the show notes. So check it out, listeners. It's a great discussion. The whole conference is very fascinating. And I was really surprised to see how long this conference has been going. I believe it said 28 years. So it's becoming the financial stability equivalent of the uh, Kansas City Fed Jackson Hole meeting. Is that fair? I'm sure the line of Fed would say yes, yeah, definitely. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. They would say, come on. That's right. We, we're, we're, we are it. All right. So in the time we have left, I want to go back to Bill Nelson as a friend of the show. And I'm, I share many views with him, very sympathetic on many of his, his positions, including ones we've just talked about. But one in particular, he wants to see the Fed's balance sheet get smaller for a number of reasons, shrink its footprint, financial system. Also, though, to in part return, at least to some extent, some overnight interbank unsecured lending. One of the motivations for this piece that I cited previously, where he he called for you know reintroducing TAF and using these collateralized lines of credit from the Fed, is that it would, in theory, all else equal, reduce the structural demand for reserves by banks. If they know they can go tap into the Fed, they don't need to sit on as big of a of a you know stock of of deposits at the Fed. In fact, he you know he noted in his piece, very interesting, we'll provide, provide a link to that as well, that you know QE has actually, if anything, added to the stigma of the discount window because if you have all these reserves, why would you ever go to the discount window unless 
you are a problematic bank. So QE, it, again, it, it's an important tool when it's used appropriately, but it can have side effects like the ones he outlined. In any event, he wants to, to see us go in that direction. And I bring that up, Stephen, because there have been a number of other central banks that have taken a look at their operating system. And so you may have seen that I had Isabel Schnabel on the podcast. She's a senior executive at the European Central Bank, and she led a 15-month review of the ECB's operating system. And what they're doing is they're going to go from a kind of a, of a floor system to, to what they call demand-driven, but somewhere in the direction of a corridor. It's not going to be quite a corridor. And in fact, they're not the only one doing this. There's a number of central banks. There was Reserve Bank of Australia, the Reichsbank from Sweden, Bank of England, they're all kind of inching away from a floor system to what they call demand-driven system, where there'll be more activity at like the repo facilities they have. So banks will kind of go to the facilities when they need more reserves or get rid of reserves. And that's kind of like kind of more market-driven as opposed to just loading them up with reserves. And sometimes the definitions get tricky. What they call ample might be different than what the Fed considers ample reserves. But I guess my question to you is, have have you heard or, or seen any other individuals, you know, talking about this potential implication of using the discount window, that it could also lead to fewer reserves being held by banks and that it might push us in the direction that some of these other central banks are going? Yeah, I mean, I think most prominently, Andrew Bailey, head of the BOE, has has sort of advanced this view. And if you look at the BOE's QT program thus far, they're starting to see pickup at their standing repo facility. So not exactly a discount window, but in, in this case, effectively the same thing. And they're much more comfortable with that. And they want to see sort of ongoing activity through the standing repo facility that they have where that's sort of the allocation of reserves into the system. You know, I, I, my sense is that the Fed is, while there's internal debate, the, the Fed is much more of the view that when the, the standing repo facility starts getting substantial value, that's the time to think about ending QT as opposed to, okay, this is sort of our smooth transition. I mean, they really talk about it like a backstop. So, I don't know that we'll get to exactly that world that we're seeing, you know, at the ECB and the BOE and others where they're, they're sort of more comfortable with sort of kind of playing with fire as far as how many reserves are left and, and, and right. living in that world where there is a little more volatility, but not obviously September 2019 repo crisis level. You know, it, it's a challenge. And the, the other thing to note about the UK, I guess, is they are actively implementing a non-bank standing discount window. It's going to start with government collateral, but they're looking; they'll look to expand it after that. And so, a part of the challenge with using something like a standing repo facility or the discount window is: can you get banks to on-lend liquidity? And we found sometimes it's liquidity regs, but we found that the, a challenge can be balance sheet constraints to really on-lend liquidity, and that's something that. QE or large balance sheets doesn't suffer from to the same degree, right? The central bank is not relying on intermediaries to to increase their leverage to you know get liquidity where it's needed to the same degree. So that could be a challenge as well. Yeah, it was interesting in, in talking with Isabel Schnabel from the ECB, and they also dealt with the issue of a leaky floor, that rates were dropping beneath the, the, the bottom level of their corridor of sorts. And they didn't set up something like the overnight reverse repo facility. That's what we set up. We set up something to catch that leaky floor, the money market funds. So rates would go down that market. They would then go park at the overnight reverse repo facility. It's a way to kind of definitely lock in the, the floor of where the Fed wanted its rates to be based on what they thought appropriate monetary policy was. And, and I asked her about that. Why don't you guys have one? And she said, money market funds aren't as big of an issue or a deal in the Europe as they are in the US. So, you know, I guess to some extent, we already have something of a repo facility to deal with this problem, but it could be even more so if, if we were to, for example, to expand the standing repo facility, who has access to it or who has access to the discount window. And I guess the concern is then, you know, the, the Fed ends up subsidizing these other players or encouraging more, you know, shadow market activity that maybe doesn't want to go down that path. So it is really complicated and it'll be interesting to see where this all ends up. Yeah, absolutely. It's a constant challenge of who do you want to interact with as a central bank? What constitutes an open market operation versus like, okay, is this effectively just – 
emergency lending to everybody or some some sort of engagement that we're not supposed to be in from a legal perspective versus something like QE where it, it, it's more plainly, okay, I've just gone out on the market and bought a treasury. All these things are sort of at play here. Okay. With that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Stephen Kelly. Stephen, thank you for coming on the program. Thanks, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings.